Good afternoon and welcome to Have We Got Planning News For You. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. It's great to be back after our three week mini break. Um, can I start with what for most of you are probably by now familiar reminders. Firstly, as you know, we broadcast the show for free, but we do always encourage you to consider making a donation to a charity of your choice. Um, we've usually supported the hugely important NHS combined charities just giving page, but given our focus this week on the housing crisis, uh, we'd like to suggest a donation to Shelter, more of whom in a moment. Um, and secondly, um, those of you watching live, please do keep the questions and banter flowing in the Q&A box. Uh, we've already had a few wonderful suggestions. Um, and in particular, please do let us know your questions for our special guest, who is this week, uh, we're thrilled to say, um, Rob Rinder. Rob, hello. Um, Barrister, Hi. broadcaster, yeah. host of Judge Rinder and many more. And, and most importantly for today, uh, the first, I think the first ever legal services ambassador, if I'm right, Rob, um, for Shelter, in which capacity you're going to be speaking to us today about how, or speaking with us about how the planning system can help address the housing crisis. So tell us, Rob, uh, where, are you, where are you calling us from and, and what are you drinking this afternoon? Uh, I'm calling you from um, Islington and um, I'm at the end of a Georgian terrace uh, in a conservation area. I should say that we got planning permission to build this. I don't know how I did it. Everybody thinks that I bribed the local <laughs> official. Um, Surely given not. What I, given I, I've, I've discovered what I'm so excited by is learning more about uh, the planning process that uh, it is this fascinating intersection between kind of politics and um, law. Seems like I did precisely the right thing. So I'm, I'm having um, scotch, which is um, neatly placed. Um, I think it's, it's both neat and neatly placed um, in a, a little scotch holder. Now that's not quite um, the usual thing, but I, 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 I like to go for a long walk in the evening with, a jog, uh, uh, with the dog, having a little sip. And I, I feel like if I don't have it in the usual kind of scotch repository, it makes me look less like an alcoholic. <laughs> so I've got like a little, you know, <laughs> so yeah, scotch. Excellent, excellent stuff. Well, um, we'll be having our, our discussion with you in the second half of the show. And I think you're going to be asking us some questions as well as us asking you. So we're going to be in a slightly different Lots. format to our usual way, which we're really looking forward to. Obviously, if there's anything you'd like to, to chip in on before we get to uh, our discussion on the housing crisis, do so. I think we've got at least one housing case. So uh, we've already had one. Somebody suggested that you should you should have a planning dispute on Judge Rinder. Um, Maybe that's <laughs> we, I, so we very nearly had something not quite similar. Um, there was a case, a New Zealand case, they wanted us to litigate about, uh, about what the um, steepest road in the world were was. Um, but it uh, it was a um, litigation between a road or a hill, I should say, a hilly road in Wales yeah. and one in Waipu in New Zealand. But um, the Guinness Book of Records intervened, so I couldn't rule. Oh, no. I, mean, you know. <laughs> I think it's going to be our collective life mission for the rest of us now to find a case that's suitable for you. Going <laughs> anyway, let's introduce the panel. Um, so, Mary, as always, um, over to you to kick us off. Good evening, everybody. Mary Cook here. As you can see, I'm in the wild woods of Wandsworth. It's dark outside. Winter is coming. And I'm on my favourite tipple. This is a gin all the way from Padstow, appropriately named Padstow Gin. So here I am uh, and uh, welcome back everybody. And lovely to see you, Rob. Nice to Thanks, see you. Mary, um, the King in the North. Uh, hello all, uh, I'm on the top of a hill in Lancashire still, uh, miles away from many of you. Uh, I'm wearing a t-shirt in honor of Rob which is The Show Must Go On, which is the Acting for Others Flea Bag Support Fund uh, and Trust Theatre Support Fund Trust. So just for you, Rob, and also not because you're ever going to have the test card on one of your shows. I've got, say, booze with a test card on. <laughs> it's called Goes to Hollywood, brewed in Denmark, and is Goes Ale, brewed with oranges. And it's probably going to be as horrible as all the other ones I choose. But <laughs> cheers. Cheers, Paul. <laughs> Chris. Now, this has never happened before. Look at what I am drinking. Oh, wow. Well. I'm drinking exactly <laughs> the same. Oh, oh no. Way. It's a delight. I saw the word Hollywood. I knew you had Judge Rinder. I thought, you know what? I'm going to go with Hollywood. But uh, that's my drink. Yes, I'm here in Hogwarts Castle, as you know, also a listed building in a conservation area. And I've got my planning permission, too. Um, and uh, I've got my owl presumption. He's here. He's listening to um, 
is listening to ABBA because of you, Charlie. But I'm yeah. going to let you explain that in due course. I am very, very excited about tonight's game. <laughs> Sash, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Charlie. You look like you're in the Oval Office. That's quite apt because I'm actually drinking tea because I've actually been instructed by Donald Trump to um, prepare his proceedings in the Supreme Court. And I've been connected into a worldwide exclusive. I've got as far as saying, ground one, only a vote for me is lawful. <laughs> any suggestions gratefully received no i'm in london and i'm really looking forward to have rob on the show it's wonderful to have our second rob and lord calmworth we've had two barristers both amongst the most eminent of their generations thanks ash well i'm charlie banner from keating chambers and i'm not in the uk at the moment so um faced with on saturday afternoon in light of the announcement um, working in lockdown, uh, given that inquiries, doing inquiries as a team commonly has become the norm in the last few months is now illegal um, due to the current um, lockdown. I asked myself the question, where's the best place to spend four weeks of doing inquiries during lockdown? And the answer was in a place where there isn't a lockdown. So here I am in Stockholm, in Sweden, um, in a hotel with two inquiries worth of papers, um, some of them whom you can see just there stacking up the various window ledgers and I'll be conducting my business here for the next, uh, next three weeks. A very beautiful city it is too. It gets dark at about five past midday. That's the one disadvantage I've noticed. <laughs> um, can I say you've incentivised this, Charlie? We're all going to write to the Swedish ambassador and tell him to put Sweden into complete lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Now, beers wise, I discovered I had no idea, actually, that Sweden is very good on craft beer. Um, and I, I, there were three candidates. There was um, Larsson, we're after called Henrik Larsson, I think famous Swedish football player, has a picture, a slight strange picture of two guys in the boat, one of whom has snapped his oar and made it into a cricket bat, for reasons I'm not very clear. Then there's this one here, the title is called Everybody's Doing It. I didn't like to ask the, the <laughs> person at the cash desk precisely what it was they were doing. I thought that might have got me into trouble. Um, and the one I've gone for, because I think it's probably the right thematic, is this one. I like the title of this, How to How to Tear Down the Wall. Well, it's been, it's been a year of tearing down walls in various ways for me. So, uh, and, and tonight's theme could be really, let's tear Charlie, down walls affordable housing. Charlie, we've just had a message from friend of the show, Bridget Rosewell, who <laughs> says, if you just abandoned your children, <laughs> no, they've, they've gone to Kiev. <laughs> they were always going to go to Kiev during these inquiries because I, uh, well, like I saw, I tend to work quite long hours during inquiries. So they're introducing Michael to his family. And Kiev are also in lockdown, so I can't do the inquiry from here. So I'm here, here in ex in exile, uh, uh, and going to Kiev afterwards. Coming back to the UK once all the crazy is over. M anyway, more, more, more importantly, Chris, don't, don't open yours. Take it back to Waitrose. It's foul. Oh. It's revolting. <laughs> I hope you've got a backup. Right, let's go on to the serious stuff. Let's get the cases um, and, um, and planning appeals out of the way, and then we can have our, um, our discussion with Rob. So um, first up, Paul, you're good. you've got our first case of the week. Uh, I am, although if I start coughing because of this repulsive stuff, apologies in advance. Right, the case I've got is a court of appeal case called DB Symmetry against Swindon Council. Um, two important things at the outset of this. First of all, uh, Richard Humphreys, successful appellant, uh, in that case, or, or acting for the successful appellant, told me about it three times in emails. Um, it's funny how barristers never tell you about the cases they've lost, but there we are. Um, and secondly, it's a vindication in terms of his decision of advice I gave to the East Riding of Yorkshire. Uh, those were in the days when they used to instruct me before they fell in love with Charlie. What can I say? <laughs> it's, it's a case. Get over it. Get over it. Never. You want to um, lose, then they don't come near you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a case about the interpretation of a condition on an employment consent granted on the east side of Swindon. So cases don't get more exciting than this. So Swansea backyard, Swindon industrial estate. Uh, and it's all about whether this condition, which made reference to the requirement to connect to a, a highway, actually meant connecting to a highway and dedicating the land over which you were building the road to connect to the highway as a public highway. Uh, and uh, there was some disagreement about it between the council and the, uh, the applicant for permission. The council said, no, it actually means that you've got to dedicate the land in order to discharge this condition. The applicant said, don't be ridiculous. They applied for lawful development certificate and said, we're gonna build a private road, not a public road. 
Uh, and uh, the, the inspector agreed with that and said, yes, you can discharge the condition by connecting on a private road. Uh, there was then a challenge by that by the council to the High Court and the judge in the High Court said, no, it means you've got to connect using a public highway. Uh, and Richard Humphrey's client uh, appealed to uh, the, the, the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal went, don't be ridiculous. Uh, they did it for no less than 11 reasons. And in fact, uh, it, it, when you read the judgment, it's a great judgment to Lord Justice Lewison. He might as well have just said, and another thing, and another thing, and mm -hmm. another thing. He just goes through bullet point after bullet point 11 times saying why his conclusion is you can't have a condition which requires you to give up your private law interest um, and that they can, you, you might be able to do it under an obligation, he leaves hanging, but you can't do it under a condition and that therefore a private road would be sufficient in relation to this. Uh, and this goes all the way back to uh, litigation uh, in the 1960s, uh, a case uh, called Hall and Shoreham by Sea and re-establishes uh, good old fashioned black letter law. So I love this case. Thank you, Charlie. Thank, thanks, Paul. Um, Kim, Kim Lewis, one of the best judges in the Court of Appeal, dare I say, to a proper, proper law, proper black letter lawyer. How um, many cases do you have outstanding in front of him, Charlie? Uh, annoyingly, <laughs> one. I wish, I wish the one I had this week was in front of him, but that's another story. Um, anyway, uh, moving on to our next case, Sash, you're going to tell us about Smith and Castle Point. I am, I am, uh, and Rob will enjoy this. This case, whilst again, I mean, Paul and I are showing Rob how glamorous planning law is because he's. <laughs> Is about I'm talking about a wall. You couldn't get much greater than that. A wall <laughs> that keep that effectively keeps a scrapyard contained. But this case in the Court of Appeal that I'm going to talk about is Glen Patrick Smith and Castle Point Borough Council and Benfleet Scrap Limited. But what's great about this case, I just wanted before I get on to what it says, it's got one of the great judicial put downs of all time, and, and Rob will enjoy this because what it says. Uh, uh, effectively, it was said, it was suggested in the written arguments provided in support of the appeal that the appeal raises issues of general application. And then Lord Justice Davis says, as far as I can see, it does nothing of the kind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other great put down is when, when there's the analysis again, Lord Justice Davis says, disposal. I am in no doubt at all that this appeal should be dismissed. It seems to me to fail at every level of argument. So I, we all send our commiserations to Wayne Beglin, who, who, had, who has obviously appeared for the appellant in that matter. But the point to take on this case, this is quite interesting. This is about a wall in a scrapyard <laughs> that contained a scrapyard. And the case of the objector was effectively that what the wall was, a, not a Trojan horse, I'm mixing my metaphors here, but effectively what it was going to do was hide intensification that the scrapyard operator was going to try and do a lot behind the walls and effectively they were going to hide it and um and that was the basis of objection at the planning stage the members rejected that permission was granted went to the high court rejected they sought to take it to the court of appeal and the fundamental contention really was that the officers and the members should have considered whether a condition was necessary to restrict the level of intensification. Of course, what the Court of Appeal said, and all of you will know, actually know, the only person that will know is Paul Hill, no Penrith District Council from 1977, which decided, obviously, a condition, surprise, surprise, has to slightly relate to the development proposed. And therefore, where you were promoting an operational development of a five metre wall, the question of intensification was not directly related to that. So effectively, this is a case and it's actually I, I don't want to personalise this to Wayne, but it is quite sobering for all of us when one, we get all excited and whipped up into a frenzy of enthusiasm about the strength of our client's case. And then when you get a Lord Justice Davis basically saying mm -hmm. that to you, it's a bit sobering. So the moral of the story is always have that third eye judging whether you're actually getting punch drunk on the thought that you've got a good point when maybe yeah. you don't. And I just wanted to mention one other thing, Charlie, which is yes. relevant because I was in the High Court last Thursday and just for those wonks, and I know Chris is one of those who loves the fine and niceties of Greenbelt law, the question of, which we've all applied, this was a case called Cornish and London Borough of Southwark, the question of whether if you're promoting something beyond the MOL or the green belt, does it fall effectively? Does paragraph 144 apply effectively? Can you take into account as part of the harm, the effect, the visual impact on the green belt or the MOL if you're promoting land development outside 
and an argument was raised there by the claimants. And, and the justification of this, of course, again, Paul will remember this, Power 315 of PPG2 used to say that you could look at visual impact on a green belt or an MOL. But in this case, the judge took the view, um, Mrs. Justice Lang took the view that no, that wasn't correct, that 144 is about development within a green belt and an MOL, and it is not about considering the impacts of development out with on the green belt. So I just thought that would be of interest to our viewers. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Sash. Um, and uh, now we've got our first of two planning appeals. Mary, um, a housing appeal that was allowed. Yes, yes, a housing appeal. And not just any old housing appeal. Mm -hmm. This is an appeal decision about the principle of enabling development involving two grade one and one grade two star listed building, all by one Samuel Wyatt, who is an important neoclassical architect at Doddington Hall. Mm. Uh, I think actually Rob, our wonderful IT technician, will have a picture um, ah. that he can share with you mm. of said Doddington Hall. So that was one of the grade uh, one uh, listed buildings. The other was called Star Barn. And there was also another hall, which is the grade two star one, Delves Hall, all owned by the Doddington Estate at Bridgemere in East Cheshire. All these buildings were on the uh, Historic England's at-risk register, and the estate also had the benefit of a registered park and garden. So uh, an inspector described that as an ensemble of heritage assets of considerable special interest. The enabling development, of course, is by its very nature development that wouldn't normally be granted because it would be contrary to the development plan. And here the proposed enabling development was housing dotted around various pockets of land beyond the registered park and garden. Some of those proposed dwellings affected the setting of the registered park and garden and so the setting of Dodding Doddington Hall. Um, it, it was a case where there was a considerable engagement with Historic England who basically supported the proposal, which is a, a crucial uh, piece of information and after the appeal but before the decision uh, Historic England issued their new good practice in planning uh, note number four and uh, of particular interest to me uh, in another matter I'm dealing with is the fact that the inspector gave that substantial weight. Now permission and listed building consent had already been granted for Doddington Hall to be used as a hotel which was agreed to be the most appropriate use because it involved the least alterations. But um, there was a heritage deficit of 13.98 million, and it was agreed that there were no grants or money available to make up that deficit. Uh, and uh, the, the housing was going to generate 9 million of that deficit. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting thing to me that the enabling development didn't actually cover the entire deficit. And uh, the balance, the landowners said they'd make up themselves and they put that into a uh, bond. And there was a 106 obligation, which, which secured the, the, the difference and also uh, obli obligated the developer to put the receipts coming in from the housing into a bank account uh, which then had to be spent on priority heritage works. So it's a classic case of the application of paragraph 79B of the MPPF. That's where uh, one of the ex ex exceptions to isolated development in the countryside is where you are uh, looking to conserve heritage assets. And all in all, um, the inspector concluded that uh, the enabling development would cause less, would cause less than substantial harm that the conservation and reuse was a, of considerable benefit. And even though the reuse didn't extend to all three buildings, so we've got one building turned into a hotel, two buildings made wind and water tight. He took the view that the 112 new homes, Rob will be disappointed to know that only 10 of them were affordable, but there was a viability assessment saying that's all that could uh, re reasonably uh, be provided. And the inspector thought that was a proportionate approach given the deficit. So it was contrary to the uh, development plan. It, uh, it was contrary to the um, neighborhood plan, but nevertheless, uh, given the very significant public benefit to the historic uh, assets, the inspector concluded um, that planning permission should be granted. So well done, Rubin Taylor, who mm -hmm. uh, appeared for the appellants. Um, it's, 
it's an interesting example um, of enabling development. Key, get the support of historic England. And also, if there is a deficit, you need obviously to pay, provide, for, uh, provide for that deficit to be made up in some way. Thanks, Lee. I mean, it sounds like a, a great victory for those, those involved, because it's always quite easy to pick apart an enabling development case in some way or, the, or another. So to withstand the scrutiny of an inquiry is pretty impressive, actually. Agreed, agreed. Another interesting thing was that the Planning Commission enlisted building consent for the, ho uh, for the hotel use that had already been obtained. Sometimes mm -hmm. you find it all being lumped together, don't you? Yeah. Absolutely, you know, yes, and then there's issues about salami sizing. Yeah, 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 so interesting. Definitely, definitely worth a read, dear, dear viewers. Um, and second planning appeal, Chris, um, you're going to tell us about the Holmwood decision. I am, I am, and for this we're going to travel to the North Midlands and the local authority of North East Derbyshire. Can I just say, I've given up on that beer, Paul. It's so <laughs> revolting that I've got... <laughs> okay, and I'm drinking goat sleep, and you'll understand why in just a moment. Well, uh, uh, Ursula brought me brought me a much better drink, so um, oh. cheers to my wife. <laughs> Martini, brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I'm mm. impressed. Gosh. Right, the Oscar. village of uh, Holmwood and uh, on the edge of the town of North uh, Wingfield, if that means anything to you if you're a local, uh, application for 250 homes, granted planning permission. Now, the applicant was one Mr Cliff Richards. But since it's a gentleman running a garden centre just outside Chesterfield, I don't believe that it's the major pop star. Huh. Uh, outline application applied for, uh, Anna Mir at DLP Consultants in Sheffield, three fields, uh, 11 hectares of land, 20% affordable, which is sort of what can be achieved in that area, ex-mining community. Single reason for refusal, uh, breach of policy any one, which is harm to local landscape. And so they had four days arguing over the landscape. But to be fair, this is on the fringes of the Peak District. It's quite hilly and a lot of it uh, is potentially visible. Now, main issue in the case was landscape. And um, something, I had a chat with Roland Bolton, who was involved in the case, and uh, Roland said to me that the inspector was really disciplined about not wanting to hear lots of landscape evidence or read loads of it, but to have a Scots schedule, which identified precisely what was an issue. And we're seeing more and more of this with the inspectorate. I think it's a fantastic thing to do. It cuts down uh, a lot of uh, wasted time and material and good statements of common ground on landscape are perfect and then retain the cross-examination uh, rather than have a round table but let's focus on what's really an issue the inspector drove this found it really useful came down to about four main issues um, and her conclusion was well it does cause moderate adverse effect on the landscape character but you know what they need some houses uh, so she granted planning permission despite the harm on a greenfield site. The other issue was our old friends. What are the most important policies for determining the application? And are they out of date? Now, the council had a five-year land supply, but they um, didn't have an up-to-date plan. North East Derbyshire are absolutely on the naughty step for this one. They've never had a plan for ages. I did an appeal there a couple of years ago in my favourite named town, Wingerworth. That is a real place. And Wingerworth uh, appeal was allowed again. Um, and the council said, oh, we nearly got a plan. And they still haven't nearly got a plan. Um, and they tried to argue that it was just the policies in the reason for refusal, which were out of date, which we see a lot of local authorities doing. And the inspector didn't accept that. That was um, Claire Searson, that was the inspector. Uh, she looked more broadly at that. She looked at a range of policies, said they're out of date. So she triggered the tilted balance, our old friend, the tilted balance, which says, presumption in favour of development, which is how we get these greenfield sites away. So two major housing appeals allowed this week. We don't always hear that, do we? Uh, so well done. And the reason I'm drinking Goat's Leap is because my good friend, Peter Goatley, was the advocate. Well done, Peter. Ah, oh, super. <laughs> Just Chris, a have a backup, great, a backup drink. Great, drink. great gag. <laughs> superbly, um, superb done. Now onto our onto our special guest discussion with with Rob. Um, and so, so Rob, firstly, just tell us a little bit more about your uh, your new mm. role with Shells. You know, what was it involved? How did it come to be? How did you get involved? And, and well, firstly, I have to say, you know, when you invited me onto a you know a planning podcast, a I 
can't lie, I thought after the first four minutes, I'd gently slip into a coma. <laughs> but I certainly <laughs> didn't think that I'd be thinking to myself, bloody hell, I actually want to tune in next week. <laughs> Who knew oh. planning this was this sort of interesting and, and sexy <laughs> and, and genuinely fun. It's sort of like, you know, sort of Melvin Bragg, but sort of without any of the sort of boring bits. This is fantastic. <laughs> you, might, you might find that we cut, we just copy that bit of video you've just but given. Planning yeah, law yeah. is the yeah. best oh, kept sexy week. law secret there is. I'm not sure, normally the collective noun of a, a group of lawyers, I think I'm not quite sure would be a malice. So, I mean, I, I sort of, I'm listening to Chris and Mary going, well, okay, well, what happened next? And what did they build? I mean, there's a program here. I want to see the end result of that hotel and then, I'm not sure I want to know what's happened, what, what horror happens on that Greenfield site, but I'm, I'm pleased that you're part of destroying it, Chris. So well, well done you. Um, <laughs> there you are. Um, the answer is um, that so obviously, you know, the, the, the great gift, and it's a real gift that you get by um, being on telly. Sorry for the noise outside. It's sort of, no, sort of like no, Beirut no in the middle of the war. I, I obviously am <laughs> not sure that they're celebrating, um, uh, 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 you know, James the first surviving as much as they're committing acts of um, antisocial <laughs> behaviour. But there you are. Um, uh, 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 as you're aware, it's um, you get an opportunity to to shed light on on things that really matter to you. And uh, I was a legal aid lawyer for about a decade doing crime, and then mm. as um, that all dwindled, it, meaning the funding, I moved into international law chiefly, which is just a posh way of saying crime abroad. Um, and getting paid for it, um, and mainly involving um, issues um, involving proceeds of crime. Mm. Um, and um, uh, when I ended up on television, what happened very quickly, my case, the f case number two that I did, and I, I think as I was sort of briefly foreshadowing last night, I realised just how warped or skewed my view of the world was, having dealt with um, freezing the assets or properties worth billions of dollars. My case number two as an arbitrator on Judge Rinder involved a case worth about 90 pounds. And I know we're pre-watershed, so I'll blank out what was said, but we are <laughs> very regulated, as if you can be very regulated. We are regulated by Ofcom. So I have to give full judgment. And um, I listened to this dispute and the woman said, oh, it's 80 pounds. And I said something like, that's not a lot of money. Uh, mm -hmm. The producers of the show who are in my ear, uh, whispering various bits and pieces, can only talk about the choreography of the case. They can't give me any substantive evidence or uh, project their opinion in, in any way, shape or form. But my producer at that moment um, from a particular rough, tough and honest part of the country, which some might describe as everywhere else outside of North London, well, <laughs> London, um, whispered loudly in my ear and said, uh, yeah, do you want to rephrase that? As I said, 80 pounds, not a lot of money. You sound like a right posh um, enter swear word there. <laughs> and, you know, five, six years in of dealing with uh, disputes, and I have to say probably about uh, 70 to 80% of the, the cases we deal with are landlord and tenant disputes of some capacity. Um, you know, I realized just how out of touch I was. And then I've been answering legal questions in the sun and online during lockdown. And my numbers are now out of date. So the short term issue, um, uh, and this is the last time we, we had sort of quality statistics around sort of April or May, was about 322,000 private renters in England um, were, um, are, are now in rent arrears um, and have fallen behind. We think, and I think, you know, like I say, nobody can rely on uh, good numbers, certainly, after last night, nobody's gonna rely on any pollsters. But certainly we know uh, that three and five calls to shelter uh, are, are about um, th this issue. Um, and um, regardless of the extension of the furlough scheme, that's only gonna get worse. So uh, my role is really to bring to the pu general public's attention, uh, the fact that uh, shelter has a legal service, a limited one to be sure, uh, but it is a kind of wraparound service. Um, there are, far too few uh, uh, lawyers. They are inevitably under resource, 46 solicitors, 25 legal advisors and 30 in legal support. That's nowhere near, it's the tip of the thin wedge of a pretty terrifying iceberg. Um, and they can help um, usually by, as you can imagine, responding to um, crisis applications. The difficulty is in most cases that they find themselves in, that that, that um, really is only a limited part of the problem. And what tends to present is somebody that has a range of issues, many of which could be resolved or could have been resolved with the help of 
one letter um, or certainly access to the type of networks that we all have and we all take for granted. You know, we often talk about privilege and this has become a big part of the social conversation, but I think we forget really best how to quantify what that privilege is. And it seems to me that the privilege is being one phone call away from somebody that can, can help you, can write the letter, can speak to authority. Um, so that's how I ended up becoming an ambassador, really to remind people that we're out there and to try and, um, as best as I can, help people on social media and um, across as many channels as possible. Uh, uh, best to uh, give them good quality information about how to act in the event that they find themselves in crisis, but also working alongside um, landlords as well. So we had a short term ask, which was in the um, wake of the end of the moratorium on applications for um, evictions, we uh, worked, say we shelter worked alongside uh, the National Residential Landlords Association. You know, it's a, as, as some people watching this know, it's a sort of unique thing or certainly a, a nuance of uh, freeholdership in, 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 in England and Wales, well, in the UK, as I understand it less so in Scotland, you know, um, that most landlords, it's their one property that they have in a mm. pension. These are not bad guys. And so um, being part of that conversation has been very important. So that's the short term ask. Obviously, it's, it's, it's really about crisis management. But the reason I'm here and the reason I'm extremely excited to be here is because there's a big long term issue and it's part of the overriding mission um, of shelter and I think it's part of the general political conversation and when you talk about it what's fascinating it's the one arena of politics where unless you're building in people's backyards which you're going to tell me about people tend to agree on which is that um, uh, the government needs rapidly to build uh, social housing mm -hmm. I mean that is the ultimate fix um, but um, as they try to do it, they're presented with a range of problems. And I guess, um, you know, the gift that I've got uh, uh, confronting this very funny, uh, very articulate, very drunk panel um, <laughs> is, um, is really getting the sort of, uh, if you like, uh, an opportunity to hear from you about some of the issues that prevent applications both from local authorities and from housing associations and other groups that are looking to work in this arena and how best to, um, how best to proceed. And uh, the real question that, that I have is, um, you know, how do you as this panel think that sort of we can change the attitudes of politicians and local residents to new housing? Because um, it seems to me that one of the big issues, especially in London is everybody desperately for when um, they want to build said uh, social housing next door to them so it's kind of over to you really thanks Robert. well what I think we've done we you know we thought about about um, this I think Mary's going to just start you've, you've got some thoughts Mary on how uh, approaches to affordable housing have, have evolved over the years in this context and how you know what, what that might mean then each of us got a few few thoughts and we might bring it back to you Rob for for what your any thoughts you may have in light of our our little anecdote so so Mary over to you well can I just start off by saying that I grew up in rented accommodation my grandparents lived in rented accommodation and I never felt when I was growing up second class uh, or in any way um, deprived because I was living in rented accommodation. It wasn't really until I went to university that I realized that there was a whole bunch of people out there who actually had parents who owned their houses and had lived in the same street all their lives. That was just not my experience as a forces child. Um, so that's a personal thing. Se second thing, I, I, I think it's just worth uh, remembering, and I'm going to go back in history, after the First World War, 80% of the country was living in rented accommodation, most of it in an appalling condition. That led to the 1990, 1919 Housing Act, which actually started to subsidise council building for the first time. By the time we got to the 1930s, do you realise we were building 350,000 homes per annum? Amazing. Then we had the Second World War, we had bombing, we lost things. And again, post-war, uh, in the 1950s, the local authorities were building 250,000 homes per annum. Mm. Then, if I, if I zoom forward, by the end of the 1960s, we were split as a country between mm. half and half, between homeowners and, and, and renters. Um, then along came <coughs> Thatcher in the 1980s. Now, she 
it, she introduced the right to buy, which was something that somebody had suggested to Jim Callahan, but he declined. Lots of people took up the right to buy. And the problem was that councils were prevented from using those receipts to continue council building. Right. So we started to lose s stock and we were doing very little to gain stock. Then we started to look to the private sector. Government started to look to the private sector. And when I first started uh, knocking around doing housing uh, appeals, actually what the developers had to do was to provide land, not houses. And then some time passed and people realized that wasn't good enough and they needed the developers to provide the housing. So the developers started providing affordable housing on sites. And in the beginning it was, oh, is that always going to be put in the noisy corner or the, the corner of the site, which is of less value? Um, and one of the, 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 the first issues was making sure that the affordable housing was 10 year blind so that you couldn't tell the difference between the private and the affordable. But in some parts of the country, they weren't interested particularly in affordable housing. And in other parts of the country, they were extremely interested in, uh, uh, in affordable housing and grants were available. There was a time when there was quite a plentiful supply of, of grants um, to ensure an adequate supply of affordable housing. Now we've got to the point where grants really have uh, l largely fallen away and there's more and more pressure on the private sector. And, and just looking to the, to, the, to the future and forgetting the politics of it for, for one moment, we've now got a government who has just consulted on the white paper on the idea of actually getting rid of all of that progress that we've made by saying no, no obligations to provide affordable housing on site, just to hand, hand a shed load of money over to local authorities and they can build. Um, now that's quite difficult when a lot of local authorities don't have any experience of house building. So I think, um, I, I'm, as you'll gather, I'm not, I'm not much impressed by the, the white paper and the idea of abandoning where we've, where we've got to. But I would want to see in some areas um, the politics taken out of this. I would like to see us stop thinking that renting is a second class thing. It isn't. I would like to see good quality provision because one of the things that people uh, worry about is that the quality of development coming forward is not going to be high and they, they don't want something sort of second class in their area. So I, I think part of the answer to this is good quality stock being built and it's not simply the private sector, the public sector should be allowed to step in, but it shouldn't be left all to them. Thanks, Mary. Well, Nicholas may raise the question, isn't, isn't a large part of the, problem the public sector has stopped building affordable almost entirely? And I suppose an associated question with that is, well, if it's being encouraged to do so again now under the white paper, have they forgotten how to do so? Because we've had so long, so many decades of, of outsourcing it to the private sector. Um, the next little kind of... Um, um, piece we're going to do was, was Greenfield versus Brownfield and how that may affect affordable housing. And, and Chris, you were going to say a few words about that. Once you've worked out how yeah. to unmute yourself. Well, I've taken <laughs> off mute. Okay, I just want to say, uh, Rob, we've been getting so many comments about you. People just love you. They love you because yes. not only do you do the telly very well, but everybody knows that you're a really smart bloke. So Shelter are so lucky to have you involved. In I've got to mention Rian Lees. She said she's in love with you. Oh, uh, well, good. I'll, I'll pass it on to my grandma. She'll be thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> now, OK, Greenfield versus Brownfield. A lot of local councils obviously find it easier to favour Brownfield sites. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing a tendency of big urban areas, big urban authorities favouring tall buildings and city centres. The trouble is these deliver virtually no affordable housing. And... The authorities are also deleting a lot of their greenfield sites. Leeds City Council recently deleted 20,000 houses on greenfield sites around the edge of the city. Those are the sites that would have delivered 30 or 40 percent affordable housing, i.e. thousands of them, in favour of urban sites. Some local authorities, especially in London, will not touch their greenbelt. I mean, greenbelt is built on here in Cheltenham. 5,000 houses are coming out of Greenbelt. So why can't London authorities do the same? I grew up in a house built in a new town that was built on Greenfield land. It, it didn't cause an end of British civilization. 
it meant that lots of people had a house that they could afford and only 11% of the country is built on. Uh, so most people should re realize more greenfield development is not a problem, but it's that which delivers the affordable housing. Um, net result, you get 30 to 50% of the houses being affordable in many parts of the country, especially where they're most needed in the South. And yet for decades, housing targets have been set and housing sites have been selected without any regard to the delivery of affordable housing and the effect of right to buy. Now, people favor right to buy because of what it means for social mobility, but the net effect is that in cities like Birmingham and Manchester and Bristol, there is actually a loss of affordable housing stock, even when all the new houses are taken into account because of the right to buy losses. Now, everybody on the panel knows, I go to every housing inquiry I do, I call an affordable housing witness. Many of you do the same as well. And that really helps win an appeal. Now, I'm trying to win for a private developer. I make no bones about that. But the affordable case just needs to be better articulated. And when it is articulated, inspectors find that really powerful. The one thing that needs to change, in my opinion, is that local plan inspectors need to be made aware that the council's choice of sites and the housing target they select, which is trying to avoid a lot of development on greenfield sites, is actually likely to deliver very little affordable and with the effect of right to buy, likely to actually see a diminution in the amount of affordable in that area. And we know there's a crisis in social rented housing. Now, Rob, you've been good enough to come on our programme, so I want to reciprocate, okay? And, and on behalf of Shelter, I make myself available to do five local plan inquiries for you, a peer for you, okay? and to, to make this case. There are other people around me that will help with that. Local plan inspectors need to know and need to he hear from organizations from shelter, which are on the front line and which see the effects and the reality of this catastrophic failure to deliver enough houses. Thank, Thank you so much, much Chris. I'm just going to pick up on, on some of that and then kind of pull it back to Rob really, for your, your thoughts. And I'm just going to give you a little anecdote really, which, which is, a few weeks ago, I did an inquiry relating to a, a proposed housing development, 35% of which was going to be affordable, uh, on an allocated site um, in a district which didn't have a five-year supply by the authority's own agreement, and it had an affordable housing shortfall of several thousand homes against its identified need. They're meant to deliver 35% over the plan period of, 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 of all homes meant to be affordable. They delivered 19% over the first nine years. And that 35% target was itself suppressed. It was less than the actual need. Um, and um, it was recommended for approval by the local planning officers. Um, they had a house builder on board who wanted to build it quickly. Uh, it was refused by members, uh, ostensibly due to objections from people lucky enough already to own a home in the locality. Um, the local authority, once, once my client appealed, withdrew its reasons for refusal, um, but the local residents maintained their objection at the inquiry. Um, the speakers in opposition included Michael Gove, who uh, I note was one of several cabinet ministers, according to the Times, to speak out against developments for housing uh, in, in their constituencies in recent weeks. And the deputy head of the planning committee, who said, and I'm quoting directly, the idea of affordable housing in Bagshot is a nonsense. I'll come back to what she said, she meant about that later. Now, that's not a particularly unusual tale. Uh, and it seems to me that um, the, the big points it, it, from stories like this are, there's no one at proceedings like this, to speak, apart from the developer who's always said to have their own vested interests. There's no one there to, to speak up for, for the people who need the homes because the process is always slanted in favour, necessarily, uh, really because of the structure of it, um, uh, in favour of, of those who are lucky enough to have their own homes in the area and the politicians who rely on their votes. Uh, and they have a disproportionate influence in the system. I, I just wonder, I, I do a lot of public law, non-planning work too, and, and quite a lot of that is pro bono for um, human rights organisations, et cetera. And, and you know, maybe there's a role for um, shelter to intervene in, in um, significantly, you don't have the resources, obviously, to intervene in every single case, but in the big cases, either in planning inquiries like CPRE do to protect, obviously, the uh, as they see it, the landscapes, they intervene in a lot of cases. Maybe organisations such as tried to G up um, housing organisations to, to, to um, do something similar, or in the big, the big cases like Hopkins that Chris was involved in in the Supreme Court, 
how, why not a half an hour, one hour intervention, just as Justice and Liberty and the Air Centre, who I act for regularly, do pro bono interventions. Did one last week in the Court of Appeal. Why couldn't Chelsea do that? And I'm, certainly, speaking for myself, I'd be more than happy to do a case like that pro bono for Shelter on the right case. And I'm sure you'd find a lot of other barristers um, and indeed planners in planning inquiries and others who'd be willing to take their turn, do their bit of pro, pro bono work, appreciating that, you know, otherwise there wouldn't be resources. And I do think maybe there is a role for, for Shelter in, in um, being the voice of, the, um, of those who don't have a voice in these proceedings. So with that, I'll hook back to you, Robin. And any, any thoughts on what we've, what we've been discussing so well, far? Thank you. I mean, um, first of all, thank you so much, all of you, for your generous offers, um, which, um, although aren't in writing, um, are, 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 are nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> They're recording. They're recording. <laughs> oh, not really, of course. So I, I'm extremely <laughs> grateful. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, Charlie, as you'll be aware, um, Shelter does um, act sort of strategically in choosing litigation and was instrumental, amongst other things, in um, something which would intersect with your two interests, um, housing planning and human rights. And as you know, the, the case which um, allowed uh, property owners to discriminate against so-called DSS tenants, um, they were instrumental. In fact, they, they, they led that litigation, but as you know, it's preclusively expensive and having experts to a group like you is just a, an enormous gift. Um, you know, uh, th th there's a lot to say. I just really want to, to, to thank you for everything you've said. I, I noticed on the screen one question that I wanted to ask all of you. It's not mine, which is, of course, what uh, affordable means. And of course, that's a, a special challenge when you think about building homes in London. And that it's not just a, a kind of architectural virtue signaling. Um, and, and that's something that really does um, need to be considered. Um, and also it does feel strange, you know, you have these wonderful developments around King's Cross, for example, and then um, you, you, people who work for the, the government as key workers doing extraordinarily important things who um, are, 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 are in arm's reach of the, the, the pretty garden, they can't see it, and they have to go up the tradesman's entrance for all of the wrong reasons, and it's not quite exactly, it seems to me, in the spirit of what social housing really uh, uh, should be. Uh, but the second question is for, for the panel, I suppose, lastly, is that this is real, really uh, infinitely more fascinating than I anticipated, because as I said at the start, it's the really where politics and law intersects and it's, it, 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 it's most obvious. And it's not just uh, about litigation, but all of you strategically being mindful about um, PR and a whole range of other factors that most lawyers don't simply have to uh, think about in the context of the short or, or, or their long-term litigation or planning. Um, the one thing that uh, Mary mentioned, which I was very interested in, is the white paper. One of the challenges to uh, building and development in general, and of course the growth of social housing, is that um, there doesn't seem to be one national unified policy. I mean, it's up to uh, the subjective and sometimes capricious whims of local authorities, mm. different policies apply differently across the country. And I guess the question is, is it possible, do you think, to build a national movement? Um, or, or is it best left as it currently is uh, to be dealt with regionally? Um, those are the two questions I have. Well, uh, can I just chip in and say that um, I mean, one of the sort of issues is land value. Land value in London, for example, is extortionate. Whereas uh, um, no. in the area that um, Paul was talking about earlier, you know, values are very low and you can't necessarily achieve um, the same level. So I'm, I'm not convinced myself that one uh, answer fits all because of the, di the difference in, in, in values. On the other hand, I think the idea of... Um, uh, having a national conversation about this is, is a really is a really good thing. And I used to think so. Ten years ago, I used to think, "Gosh, there's surely there's going to get come a point where everybody over forty is really going to start worrying about where their children are going to live, and surely that will make them all a little bit more open-minded uh, and make them support change more." I don't know what it is about this country that we're we're a bit frightened and, and reticent about change. I mean, take those people in 
down the A30 in, in, in posh Egham or wh wherever it was, they, they should be welcoming the uh, good quality housing, yeah. offering decent homes to people. On that point, can I can I weave in a comment from Andy Cook, a theme that we've we've had in the past, and who doesn't help that that the general approach to the landscape and visual effects of development is any new um, built form on land that is currently unbuilt on is necessarily a bad thing. That change equals bad, and that's something that all of us do in Plyo to see again. It's like Groundhog Day again and again and again. Change must necessarily be bad, and uh, we've already said on this show, wouldn't it be great if the guidelines for landscape and visual or the PPG could could say something that gave a nudge to decision makers. So you shouldn't just equate the change to the bad. And you can actually, through high quality design, um, have um, have a change for the better. Chris, you you had a just to answer Rob's question about the affordable, the definition under the Conservatives it has gradually changed. And um, I'm going to offer a political view here, but the Conservatives don't see any votes in social housing. They just don't. So they are changing the definition so that it makes effectively aspiring Tory voters, uh, gives them their first home. But the social housing, most councils, particularly in those greenfield areas that can deliver it, Conservative councils are moving away from any kind of social housing. They're moving to affordable rent or low cost market housing. And that is a major, major problem. Um, and as for your issue about you know, a national voice, Younger people are just not represented in this process, as Charlie says, and there's a real problem trying to get them engaged. The white paper talks about more digital uh, engagement, mm. and that's positive, but it, they need a national spokesperson to say something. Now, I don't know if there's anybody sort of on the telly or in the media who might be able to speak up <laughs> for somebody. If you're busy, <laughs> you can people. But it, they need a voice. They need a central yeah. focus that says young people need better opportunities not to be caught in a position where housing is unaffordable to people going out, doing nursing, doing teaching to everybody. It's all wrong. It's all we, wrong. We need to see more. We need to see more young people coming forward in local government, don't we? Come on, yeah. all the all, all yeah. the planners out there. Why aren't you putting yourself forward for election and changing your local councils? Can, can I answer the question that, 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 that Rob posed us directly? Um, and I love the idea of directly answering a judge's question on this show, it's marvellous. Um, <laughs> um, uh, affordable housing means that which is affordable to people that couldn't otherwise do it. I was born in a council house south of Scarborough. My parents were a young 1960, my mother was 17, my dad was 19, they couldn't afford anything. So they were paying two and safety in the pickled egg at that stage to live in decent housing um, in a, a, an estate that was built from the clearance of the slums in Scarborough um, in the, well, the 30s really. Uh, and it was good quality housing, it still is. Large chunks of it have been sold off to the private sector. Affordable housing means that which is affordable to people that are at the bottom, bottom of the ladder. And the problem that we have is that in, in 1969, the last time we delivered 300,000 houses, 40% were delivered by the public sector, most of them by councils. The experiment that we've had since the, the early 1980s of not building public sector housing uh, has failed. The market-led approach has failed. If we're going to return the market-led approach, we need, and this is my nudge of the week, as it were, weaving it in, we, we need decision makers to recognise that affordable housing is not just, oh, it's a significant benefit of the scheme. It's a critical benefit of the scheme. If you've got a scheme with a lack of five-year land supply uh, adjacent to a major conurbation, two and a half uh, years of, of land supply against the five-year land supply, that doesn't just mean we haven't got enough houses. It means the people at the bottom of the ladder are struggling to get on the housing market and you are skewing the housing um, uh, that system to prevent people getting on the ladder and we're storing up problems for future generations. Um, the sooner that we get back to recognising that public sector intervention actually has to happen, the better, which makes me sound more left-wing than Chris, which is extraordinary. <laughs> I, th I think that's something that we're all agreed on. Yeah. I mean, interesting, Mike, Mike's um, just made a comment. Um, I'm using first names because otherwise the GPDR police will come around in their blue helmets. But um, <laughs> when he started his uh, career in 1988, the housing department, when the council granted themselves plan permission and then built the houses, we may not go back to those days, but a streamlined process, public bodies will at least help to cut through some of the, the web tape and the costs, et cetera. And that's, that's obviously a good point, isn't it? 
Um, yeah. And I think what we see now is more public and private partnerships anyway. I mean, we, we have registered providers who uh, 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 take on the affordable housing that is built by the private sector. And increasingly now on very large schemes, there are partnerships between these organizations. And, I, I, and that is, that's another part of the answer um, to my it's mind. Good. More it's from that. that's gone villages from uh, halfway through um, season one. If Garden Villages were underscored by public sector investment to build houses that would be available for rent and then wouldn't be subject to right to buy for, I don't know, 20 years, then that potentially gets over a big hurdle. I don't know why we don't intervene when, it, when it's so crucial. I always find it astonishing that affordable housing in the planning context has literally no statutory basis. Literally none. It's astonishing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. <laughs> can I ask Rob, can I ask Rob, from, from your point of view, how, how can we help you? Because um, we've, got a, we've got knowledge and all the people we work with have got a lot of knowledge. How, yeah. how can we help shelter? Well, the answer is um, precisely as you already have. I mean, I'm, I'm, we're, we're not going to be um, tapping you up for um, the type of crisis management that we need, but in the long term, as we, we, we see what emerges in the next 12 months. And, you know, I'm privy, as I'm sure some of you are, to, to numbers that, frankly, make us, well, I've been looking at precedents that I thought had been consigned to the dustbin of history, issues relating to force majeure and that sort of thing, which, yeah. are, you know, um, you know, stuff from the 1930s. So um, the answer is, I'm, I don't know hold on to the promise you've made to help. Um, I, I suspect there are going to be um, various applications for temporary builds and that sort of thing that are going to meet all sorts of challenges. And that those sorts of emergency applications are going to require really serious elbow and muscle from people like you. So um, I, I can't say for sure yet, but um, I'm enormously, um, well, grateful uh, that, that I came on, have we got planning news for you? So um, well, it's, a, it's a helpful start. Thank you, so. <laughs> you know how to get hold of us if we can. Have, just before we, we wrap mm -hmm. up, and a couple of other little topics to deal with. Um, tell us what, what you've been doing, what else have you been doing? You've got a, a show starting on Monday about the Holocaust, which sounds I good. do, yeah, I've got a, I do hope people watch. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, uh, it's called uh, My Family, The Holocaust and Me, and it's um, a story of not really just my family, it's about second and third generation mm -hmm. Um, survivors who have gone back to rediscover their stories and of course it's uh, it, it's not just about the Holocaust it's about locating trauma within our own families and how we come to understand um, our own parents uh, or grandparents and remember all of them generally speaking were themselves traumatized and what does that mean when you're a parent or to be a child of a parent who's been through uh, a, a trauma uh, but above all else all the stories are located we think about to, to bring it back to planning to it they're all located in western europe and when you look at some of the the bauhaus and some of the experimental buildings that you'll see in the program in 1930s amsterdam or in uh, certain parts of northern paris that you'll see or even in germany and you see these buildings and where these stories are deliberately located in the west what they're chiefly about um, are the lives of people who are completely complacent in their democracy and what I hope it I hope it resonates with people in, in, in this way, you know, all you need was the right uh, economic catastrophe, the right conditions, people to feel aggrieved by a treaty and the right leader in the wrong place at the right time to blame the wrong people and you've got your algebra for human depravity and um, that's chiefly really what the programme is about. I hope people watch it. It, it's, it was in it yet more privilege led on more privilege and um, a complete gift to be able to tell that story. And I, I think people will be really affected by it. It's on Monday, it's so, starts on Monday, Monday at nine. Uh, exactly. Monday at nine, nine o'clock. And then it's also on the following week uh, where I, uh, I got the, the chance, the opportunity to take my mum to make Kaddish, the memorial prayer at uh, Treblinka. And uh, we're there with the last, I actually thought he'd, he'd, uh, he'd died. Um, it, it turned out through a miracle of brilliant producing um, that in fact the last eyewitness to, to what happened there was alive. He's from Gothenburg in Sweden. He agreed to come and stand on that ground with me and my mom. Uh, and so we're there standing with the last living eyewitness. Um, and it was a complete gift. It was extraordinary. Um, yeah, I, I'm certainly, you know, my, my wife's granddad was in Dachau. So, you know, it's something that's, you know, as with so many families, it has a direct 
personal significance. So thank you for doing it. And thank you so much for joining us as well. I should... oh, it's been such a... I genuinely, I want to be clear, not just your list, I'm not sort of just saying, so I do, t- you know, I, I have to, the various things I have to do, I, I have to say, this has been an absolute delight. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, it's, it's planning law. I know it's one, it's one of those secrets <laughs> that people find themselves. I used to pass, you know, Keating Chambers all look sort of bit posh and scary. I didn't realise it would be fun. Who knew? <laughs> there have been people that say, can, can, people have asked to see your whiskey dispenser. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, 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 it's literally under the table, but it's, I, I promise you, it's, there's no way. No, 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 no. I, I kept it delivering. I, <laughs> I sipped it say. before I came on. By the way, Charlie, you should be aware that there's, uh, there's a big news flash that just got, you'll be fined £200 if you're in Sweden on holiday so just, for, <laughs> just to be clear <laughs> is, people, have, people have pointed out that it's been added to the quality list but i think that presupposes that i'm actually coming back anytime soon because uh <laughs> you know i'll suck in our own rooms doing you know doing everything in isolation then i can do Charlie, it here, Charlie, you know? Charlie i just wanted to say there are lots and lots of planners watching and they will be absolutely delighted that judge rinder has said that planning is a secret interesting area of the law do you have please you pleased everyone. Who I knew? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. You know, you know, you, you, especially these days, you know, you meet sort of criminal barristers or, or or people doing other work, and we all understand the variety of reasons why. Generally speaking, there's a kind of shrug and a sense of exhaustion. But to kind of meet um, a, a group of people that's sort of passionate about it, and you know, mm. realise whether they're for private developers or on the other side that there's a, 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 a real kind of element in excitement and vested interest in the outcome. Um, no, it's just saying? really nice to speak to a group of lawyers who seem to be happy with what they do. <laughs> so, I'll tell you what it is. What, what sets planning apart from everything else is, is we're involved in, I think we said this last night in our prep session, we, we're about creating stuff. Every, yeah. every, almost every other element of law, it's an argument about something, the, something that's gone wrong in the past. We're all, for our own various clients or the decision makers listening on this, we're all involved in creating a decision. I think that's the that's the fundamental difference, which makes it so much more exciting. And mm. this, not just the lawyers, but all the other consultants who, who watch this. And, and, and we actually change people's lives completely. And I always say this when I'm doing housing development, remember that feeling when we went into our first house. And, you know, with the legions of people objecting, when you're promoting housing development, you are literally transforming people's lives and making it one of the greatest days that yeah. people have when they take possession of their first house. And, and I will- it was from that, uh, Douglas, Douglas Bond, who, uh, who I worked with in that recent uh, planning case I mentioned, um, he, he was talking about the economic benefits and often they're dismissed as, as, you know, oh, well, every case has its own economic benefit. He said the last time he was before a planning committee, uh, he got permission from the planning committee. He went to the car park and someone came up to the car and said, thank you, you've just saved my job. Mm. Construction worker, you know, powerful. The real human impact of what we do. And that's so important, obviously. So important. I, I should Thank say, that so- we're going to put a little link up or, or a, a sign up on, I think, our IT um, consultant, Rob, is going to work at the end of a how to donate to shelter. So Thank you so much for that. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, and can, can I just say, by the way, to all our, list, all our listeners, both on YouTube and also live, go to the shelter website, particularly the shelter legal website, but go to the shelter website. There are some extraordinary research papers there. There's one in 2017, there's one in 2019, um, it's a bit of a rabbit hole, I have to say, but it's really stuff that we should be dragging to right. funny decisions. Oh, so, thanks, well, Paul. For, for, yeah, you're right about the rabbit, but thank you so much for pointing that out. Yeah. Super. Now, quick, quick one. Um, praise and champion. Uh, sorry, praise and champion. Champion and nudge of the week. Uh, Chris, are you a champion? Yeah, I've got. Bear two. with you one second whilst I get my drink. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Spencer. <laughs> Well, I've got to, and I'm going to wait till Rob gets back to here, because if you're interested in my first champion, which is your Chambers, Charlie, your Chambers have just won Chambers of the Year. Uh, And the reason they've won it, I think, amongst the many things that are great about your Chambers, is there is a very wealthy commercial set which has funded the pupillage in a criminal set because there's a lack of, obviously, criminal work and it's a very difficult time. And I think that, I mean, that's not the only reason that your set is one, but I think that's amazing that a commercial set should look around and see how could we help another area of law? That is just fantastic. So that's my first champion, but my second champion and the main one is everybody who works at Shelter. Everybody 
who looks after people, who care about people, who donate their time. Everybody at Shelter, a full round of applause. They are terrific people doing terrific work. And finally, can I just ask Sasha, are you off to a country in Western gig? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, a country what? Country are you off to Western? a country in Western gig? Because I haven't seen you in that outfit before. <laughs> This is sporting. This one of his sporting. Oh, that's not country in Western. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> no. Mighty Chris, Rangers. Chris, I mean, you know, uh, uh, sorry. I think you, I think Sasha, you look you look very sports direct chic. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I'm, I don't fancy my chances turning up in Arkansas with this top on. That's for sure. Definitely <laughs> <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> I dare you to. Paul, nudge. Yeah, um, my, my nudge of the week goes to the brewers of the city of Swinghingen <laughs> in Denmark, <laughs> who should give up brewing this garbage and selling it in Waitrose. It's appalling. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Brilliant. I love how you and Chris both fell for it. Well, look, that's all from us today. Thank you so much for joining us, and particularly thanks to Rob for coming on the show. Thank you. Such a really important and enjoyable. Absolutely. Oh, it's been a joy. Thank you. Thank you. Please, let's carry on this discussion. Next week, we're back. We've got um, Nicholas Boy Smith as our special guest. He's the founding director of Create Streets, a member of the task force that came up with the proposals in the planning white paper, and the recently appointed head of the new and as yet unnamed national design body. Um, so uh, please come and join us for that. Same time, same place. Uh, please email us any suggestions for what we should cover. And uh, please don't forget your donation to Shelter. You'll see the details in a moment. Good night and um, see you next week. Thanks again, Rob. Cheers, Cheers Rob. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Rob. Bye. Bye.